So in the past video, I tried to justify why this notion of h1 of x defined by some non-obvious ways is a good attempt at understanding what should be the length of arbitrary subsets of R2 that we somehow suspect are one dimensional. For example, this set of uh, random looking curves and some uh, points. And uh, just a quick reminder that we, we broke our space into pieces. So we, we cover our set by countable union of uh, smaller pieces called EIs. We add those diameters of those sets and under the restriction that these coverings have diameters no more than some positive delta. And this infimum over all such possible coverings is H1 delta. Then we take delta goes to zero, the limit of H1 deltas, and call it the first or one dimensional Hausdorff measure of X. So before we move on with defining Hausdorff measures for arbitrary positive dimensions, uh, and also going over some proofs about them, I wanted to continue with uh, with some more motivation about their their um, existence. So there are several natural questions to be asked. For instance, what is wrong with Lebesgue measure? So we knew from before that to measure uh, arbitrary looking sets, we had this um, notion of Lebesgue measure, uh, which generalizes our notions of length in R1 and our uh, area in R2 beyond just rectangles and maybe triangles. So the problem with the Lebesgue measure is that if you are living in R2 or in Rn for that matter, you can never talk about one dimensional measure or size of objects using Lebesgue measure because to the Lebesgue measure, which is L2, um, the Lebesgue measure of anything that does not have area will be zero. And that means from the point of view of Lebesgue measure, either you are two dimensional and have some area or you're a null set. And that is not suitable for studying curves in R2, let alone studying arbitrary subsets. And you cannot of course here talk about the L1 measure of X because uh, you're not living in R1 and Lebesgue measure L1 only applies to subsets of R1. So if you want to move into R2, you have to apply Lebesgue measure 2. And then and as we talk, uh, as I discussed, it just misses everything that is not two dimensional. So to study one dimensional size of this set, um, you have to look for some for something new. And Hausdorff measure is one um, way of doing that. And the best thing about it is that it, it also works in arbitrary metric spaces. So it immediately generalizes to all metric spaces. Um, so that answers that question. Question number two is, okay, um, we have constructed this uh, H1 out of all these infimums and supremums and limits, um, but is it really agreeing with our previous notions of length? If I apply this H1, to a line segment, do I really get back the length of that? If I apply that to a circle, do I get the parameter of the circle? And the answer is yes, so it does agree with them. And moreover, if you have a one dimensional manifold, not just a circle, so if you have any one dimensional manifold, then the length H1 agrees with the Lebesgue measure on the manifold. So you can use uh, local parameterizations and uh, change of variables formula to, to define a measure mu on your manifold, uh, which is one dimensional here. And it turns out that indeed um, these 
end up being equal. So, um, so that is also good to know. Uh, also notice that to define H1, one only needs to know what infimums are and what coverings are. Compare it to how one would construct the measure on a manifold. So you have to go through a whole lot of manifold theory to really understand local coordinates. You have to know the change of variables in analysis in multiple dimensions and only then construct this mu and then there you have to come up with proofs that it is independent of local parameterizations and whatnot. However, H1 is quite straightforward to define. And of course, H1 applies in arbitrary metric spaces um, and uh, this measure mu works only if you are in the manifold world, in the smooth world. So that also is good to know. So that, that H1 is not a random object we have created. And question number three is, now that we have this H1 and it agrees with the other notions in the smooth cases, does it do actually more? Um, and the answer is definitely yes. Uh, even if you're talking about objects that are not per se manifolds, for instance, there is this uh, tip here where it fails to be a smooth manifold um, with the induced topology of R2, still H1 does make sense. Uh, the way H1 will work is that, uh, well, number one, H1 for definition does not require anything. And uh, we see that if you, uh, if you remove those corners, this is a bunch of manifolds. So in this very picture, again, H1 is summing these length of the, the smooth parts and the, the corners have no one dimensional measure so they will be ignored. Uh, but this still, this object can be studied by manifold theory because you remove a, a finite number of points and it is some pieces of manifolds. But, but the point is that even if you had some infinite number of such breaks and if they accumulated somewhere, you could still talk about H1 and uh, and the best thing is H1 is a unified, unifying object. So you don't have to, for, for each such object, you don't have to come up with uh, understanding the, the breaking points. You don't have to manually find out where your object breaks and, and finding the other pieces where it is hopefully a manifold. Um, so H1 just by definition applies and you can talk about the, the length of such objects. But this is actually not the scariest object that you can see because it is a countable union of manifolds. There do exist some subsets that I, for obvious reasons, I won't be able to draw, but here's, here is the, what those objects look like. So there are some, some objects in, in R2 that have the following property. They have positive and finite H1 measures. So in some sense, um, they are one dimensional. However, if you have, if you have a smooth curve or even a Lipschitz curve, the intersection of that with this curve, uh, will have H1 measure zero. That is, you have a one dimensional object of positive measure, positive length, which is invisible to any, any smooth curve. So you cannot capture any piece of this object as a manifold. And, and that, that is why H1 does achieve more. So you can talk about, um, integrating, real valued functions on your on this space x with respect to the Hausdorff measure um, and uh, and you cannot do this with any manifold theory because no piece of your x is actually a manifold so um there are many interesting such spaces x that you do want to do some analysis on them and uh, the only or maybe the, the, the most elementary way of doing it without too much other stuff is the Hausdorff measures. Um, and uh, 
if you want to read up more on, about how Hausdorff measures are used, uh, you can begin by looking at the uh, article on geometric measure theory, say on Wikipedia, that's a good starting point. So this is a theory, a, a rich theory where you want to do manifold theory and differential geometry. You want to talk about areas, you want to talk about um, curves, tangent spaces, and so on, but in a rougher uh, world where um, you do have all these kinks and cranks. Um, so you bring in measure theory to study manifold theory. So my next video will be on um, developing more of the Hausdorff measures and soon we will begin talking about their properties and hopefully see some uh, proofs of these. Have a great one and uh, please remember to subscribe. Just click on that hippo and the subscribe button will show up. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.